Great. Good afternoon, everyone. And we are so thrilled that you can join us for the first webcast of the year. Higher ed, um, sorry, EdTech Unleashed, charting the course for higher ed in 2024. Please take a moment and introduce yourselves in the chat and let us know where you're joining us from. Megan, can you advance this, please? Thanks so much. My name is Kim Naraki. I'm the Assistant Director for Events and Programs at WCET. We'll put a link to the slides in the chat and you can download those if you like. Um, and as we go through the webinar today, if you have any questions, please enter them into the question box and we'll get to them during the Q&A portion. If you put your questions in the chat, we often lose track of them. We are recording this webinar and we will share with that the link to that with you by next week. And now I'd like to introduce today's moderator, my friend and colleague, Megan Raymond, WCET's Director of Membership and Programs. Thanks for joining us today, Megan. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. And Kim failed to mention that part of her job title is to be the superhero of WCET. So she does much of the heavy lifting for our events and programs here at WCET. We're grateful for all that she does. As Kim said, I'm Megan Raymond with WCET and I've been here, gosh, almost 17 years. And one of the best parts of my job is that I get to work with phenomenal people doing amazing student-centered work across the US. Uh, we even have a member in Morocco. So I would say that we're impacting students across the world, across the universe. Today's esteemed panelists are gonna go ahead and introduce themselves momentarily. But I just wanna encourage you to participate in the conversation via chat and do enter your questions into the Q&A. Sometimes I lose track of them if the questions end up in the chat. So we'll, we'll go ahead and do introductions. Let me advance the slide here. And we'll start with Awesome. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Awesome Ali. I'm the executive director of what we call the Biggio Center at Auburn University. It's a central unit that in, uh, involves uh, including Auburn Online, which is our online uh, uh, classroom support uh, and includes uh, educational development. And we have a testing center as well as all of our educational technology and LMS support. I've uh, been working a lot with artificial intelligence over the last year and a half, uh, particularly, uh, and then have uh, had a background in software engineering, information systems management, and then uh, my doctoral works in self-directed learning and education. Uh, looking forward to speaking with you today about where we might be headed. Great, thank you. And Mordecai? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Dr. Mordecai Brownlee he proudly serves the uh, sixth president of Community College of Aurora, uh, one of 13 colleges within the Colorado Community College system. Uh, we serve just under 9,000 students, uh, and we are the most diverse college in the state of Colorado. Over 50% of our students are first generation, uh, and we are the number one provider uh, within the system of concurrent enrollment. So uh, well over 60% uh, uh, of our students are actually in the high schools. Uh, so excited to be here today uh, to talk about uh, how education technology is intersection with the work that we're doing, how we're embracing it, and how we're utilizing it as a tool towards social and economic mobility. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. And Amy. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Amy Smith, Chief Learning Officer at Strider Line. And for those of you who may know, may or may not know Strider Line, we are the nation's leading provider of online asynchronous courseware uh, for the gen ed courses inside of colleges. So we serve on average about 45,000 students a year partner with over 150 colleges and universities, and we are a great entry point, gap filler, or a wonderful place to pick up a course to graduate uh, to get everybody persisting, retaining, moving, and completing on time in higher ed. It's super good to be here today. Thanks, Meg. Great. Thank you all. So today's esteemed panel of higher education leaders will discuss a range of topics, including leadership changes and their impact on online learning units, the evolution of credentialing and how emerging technologies affect teaching and learning. We'll also be examining the impact of technologies on the student experience, including the use of everyone's favorite topic, AI. As we navigate the rapidly evolving ed tech trends, it's important that we center equity and learner first practices. Our panelists will discuss how higher education can keep pace with these trends while ensuring that we prioritize our students' needs. Again, this is a facilitated conversation and we ask that you participate in the conversation, keep the chat lively, 
and enter your questions into the Q&A, and we'll get to those after we get through some of the panel questions. So panelists, I'd like to begin with leadership changes and the ripple effects on online learning units. Let's start with you, Mordecai. How have leadership changes affected online learning units in higher ed? Thanks for the question there, Megan. I will tell you that um, one thing for sure that we've had to uh, look at is, is uh, organizational structure and effectiveness of um, and making sure that we properly have uh, our online education, educational technology uh, departments uh, properly aligned and, and structured and resourced uh, within the college. And this is a conversation that certainly we're having at a national scale to think about how to ensure that uh, the advancements, certainly in artificial intelligence, are being embraced by the academy, but then properly uh, being placed within the academy in a means which it is welcomed, uh, the advancements in the student experience. And so I would say from a leadership standpoint, certainly Certainly has been ideology. One is an ideological shift. It's not something to fight. It's something to embrace. Um, and I think that it will also be a part of the curve and the forward thinking uh, of how we are effective and how we serve our students. I think the second part of that leadership uh, question that resonates with me is, is then uh, making sure that it is built within the strategic plans of our institutions and our organizations uh, to make sure that it is first and, and forefront in the minds of how we are leading the work of our respective institutions. And and in shaping the ideology and the accountability behind it. Awesome. Do you want to respond? Uh, well, I mean, maybe add on instead of respond, but I think it's worth noting that probably many of us are at institutions where there's been a lot of leadership changes in the last two years after the pandemic. Um, probably many of you are working for a new president, a new provost, or, or both, or and and you know, or other new senior leaders that are that are at the institution. Uh, so. Uh, you know, if you've been at your institution, you know, for a little bit longer than they have, your institutional expertise becomes very important. Uh, and how do we navigate that? I think what we're seeing is higher ed is in less and less of a bubble uh, than maybe perhaps we fa uh, fancied ourselves being. Um, so if we look at some of the macro trends in terms of, you know, this being an election year and, and a lot of uh, legislative sessions starting, uh, you know, what, what, what kind of impact does that have in terms of the, uh, how we navigate uh, those realities over the next several months and over the next year, certainly. Um, and also, you know, the, the rulemaking changes. I know WCT is a great resource for, for so much of what's going on uh, in Washington, D.C., about how that's going to impact, particularly what we see in terms of the impact it will have uh, for online learning. Eager to see how that all shapes out um, in the next month and a half here. Uh, and I think it's also interesting to know that in 2023, there was, <clears throat> especially when we talk about ed tech, there was a uh, a very uh, limited number of, uh, of you know, major deals, so to speak, in terms of the way private equity funds flowed and because of just a lot of the interest rates and things like that. I think in 2023, uh, 2024, as we see perhaps maybe a softening in terms of, uh, uh, you know, some of the monetary policies and some of the interest rates uh, maybe coming back down, we'll start to see again a rise in investments in the tech firms that may mean a lot more emails in your inbox from lots of companies promising to solve all the problems. Uh, in the world, but also how do we navigate and not respond to all the flashy things, but also reaffirm our, you know, goal of student success and, and you know, staying true to the mission. I think those are going to be some interesting challenges for us in the next year. Excellent. Amy, as you speak with institutions, what are some of the challenges and opportunities for digital learning leaders that you see in the current landscape? Yeah, uh, good question. So thanks, Megan. So let's go back a little bit to Mordecai, where he was really talking about commitment right, from the university standpoint, ideologically, as well as strategic plan. Mordecai, thank you for nodding on. I don't, I'm putting words in your mouth. And then back to a Sims alignment that we're all here for student success. When you put those three things together in the triangle, one of the things we're seeing with our partner schools and for leadership is back to that realignment. So Mordecai, you had talked about organizational efficiency and effectiveness and structure, and that structure does matter, right? We know that from a resource and financial perspective, as well as a student experience perspective. We're seeing a lot of those realignments. So whereas ed technology, the, um, the director of tech offices, the IR office, and the online division often used to be separate units, they're becoming more integrated into, honestly, the president's cabinets centralized leadership, a much larger voice in that org structure and in those roles. This creates new growth opportunities for ed tech leaders as an opportunity for career, their personal careers and their department's careers. 
and also opportunities to serve students in different ways because it's just they're more integrated now. So the conversation is more parallel across campuses and across institutions. So honestly, we see it we, from our partners. We see it all really as a positive. I can't believe I just said that, but I did. It's positive. Excellent. And to that point about alignment, I'm sure we have some friends from California that might be active in the chatter about this, but, you know, it is imperative that we're articulating that alignment. So how can digital learning units articulate the alignment with the, with the institution's mission and value, as well as the student demand? I don't know who wants to take that one. Well, I mean, I think it's fair to say that a lot of, particularly if you're working in online learning, you know, so much of that really has its founding in response to student demand and access and, and uh, you know, aligning with what students want. And so uh, it's maybe it's just articulating that better, uh, you know, telling our story better and maybe uh, something maybe as simple as that. You know, I'll jump in there, too, and, and just say that I think that now is a very pivotal point in higher education that it's having to determine its relevance mm -hmm. in a way to where it has not had to determine its relevance historically. Um, and so you have um, a new generations coming into the space uh, looking for something differently from their higher education experiences. I'm excited because I feel as though if I were to be honest in my own personal beliefs, I think that higher education has moved too slow and we have kind of insulated ourselves. Uh, we throw innovation on the banner. We throw it on the wall. We throw it in the brochure, but we really haven't been as an innovative as the marketplace has. And so you have students now entering into these educational experiences, seeking similar experiences like they would see in the marketplace. And so from the articulation standpoint, I think that institutions are reaching a point to where they have to embrace in order to be relevant because now uh, there's no longer a belief, I think, in general society, American society at least, that you have to go to your local university. You have to go to your local community college in order to receive uh, success and achieve success. There's so many other doors and pathways now towards the achievement of that. And it is entities that are embracing this technology. So it's very important, I think, that institutions really see the alignment of technology and its advancements into their mission. Otherwise, I think that they will continue to lose their place in the overall marketplace. Excellent. Megan, can I ask a question of these two about that, if you don't mind? Please do. Thank you. So, Asim, let's take telling the story better, and then let's take that innovation, Mordecai, that you're really talking about, that we're working toward thinking we are always innovating, haven't always had to be. How do those two, in your two perspectives, how do those two things to go, go together better? What is the new story we should be telling, and in what ways? And if you don't like my question, you just tell me and we'll pass I, the ball. We I'm love your question, name. Amy. We love your question. You know, it's <laughs> something to think about, right? Wanting to be intentional and certainly uh, didn't know if Asim had, had something forefront of mind. I, I think that how I'm interpreting your question, it is imperative uh, now more than ever that we unpack as an overall sector of higher education, what our experiences have been, have been up to this point uh, and be honest with its outcomes. And then ask how those outcomes, being honest with, have they failed to truly close equity gaps? Have they failed to serve as an engine of economic mobility? Have, have, have they been responsive to the marketplace and the needs of industry, business and industry? Uh, are we, you know, what are the ways in which we're, we're looking at those from low socioeconomic communities and then not only dealing with the digital divide, but also dealing with digital literacy and how we are educating properly these individuals to integrate uh, technology into their everyday life beyond just scrolling for the sake of entertainment. Uh, and so I think there's a lot there to unpack that I will want to spend more time with. I agree. And so thank you for that. I think that, I mean, that's a, that's a new narrative, Mordecai. That is different. That is a shift. That's a left-hand turn. Yeah. Um, owning, owning into that and leaning in and really talking about it. And if those, if, and when those outcomes are not positive, right, that's not something we're great at as a, as an industry. So a sim, I don't want to uh, take stage from you. I just, I had to passionately respond. Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I mean, I can share, uh, you know, so we're, a uh, Auburn university is a SAC COC accredited school. So 
we have what's called a QEP, a quality enhancement program that has to be uh, campus-wide, has to be intentional, has to be lengthy, so it's 10 years long. Uh, and our QEP is focused on post-graduation outcomes. Uh, and so what that means is not, did you get a job after, but the quality of the job, not just did you get into grad school, but also did you get into the grad school you wanted? Uh, and what that's created for us is uh, the way we're implementing it is by having uh, seed grants uh, to, or you know, to units on campus that are proposing ideas of how do they align uh, with what the students are coming to college for, which is what's going to happen to me after I graduate. And, uh, and you know, I think that's challenged uh, some folks maybe, and, and it's given an opportunity to other folks who have been ready for this conversation about, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we do that we used to tell our story along, you know, the lofty ideas of, hey, you'll learn and this and that. But then now we're able to kind of craft that in a way to say, yeah, I know you'll get better job opportunities because of the credentialing that's available to you and because of this new element of, you know, like how to articulate your skills and 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 those kinds of opportunities as well. Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And thanks for your question, Amy. You know, I think we all need to do a better job communicating what the overall value is to our learners. And I think that's a nice segue into our next group of questions around credentialing. So UPSIA recently released a report about the alternative credentials business and program models. And I think Kim has a link handy that she can share with that, that research. But the research findings show that many institutions don't view alternative credentials as a strategic priority. Yet, if you go over to you know, Credential Engine and look at their registry, there's over a million credentials in there now. So there's a little bit of disconnect. But Amy, I know you're prepared with a slide to talk about the ROI of credentials. So I'll pull that up. But if you want to start addressing that question. Yeah. So one of the, of course, the key conversation with everything from the federal rulemaking, right, down to the student level, what's my degree going to cost and what will what will I gain is an ROI conversation. And so while we're all thinking about credentialing, micro-credentialing, certificates, basically benchmarks along the way to whatever degree pathway uh, a student is in, Couple questions come up, of course. One, is the hiring world ready to receive it? We all nod our heads and think, yes, are they really? And two, is the value really there for a student? Hence ROI. So when we think about credentialing programs inside of an institution and how we partner at Straighter Line with institutions around this, there are gazillions of variables. I'll be honest with you, just that's my unmathematic word for there are just bajillions of them. There are so many ways to think about it. But in the research, and particularly also in the Subsea study, thank you for posting that, Megan, um, the, there are a couple of key variables that are most top of mind depending on whose stakeholder lens through which we're looking. So for students, of course, we always see economic mobility and time to pay the investment. So Economic mobility, meaning am I going to be more agile? Do I have more choice in job? Not just increased salary, but more choice in their local ecosystem where they live, work, et cetera. From an institution perspective, ROI we see around credentialing measured in mission and community needs. Mordecai, I can't speak to community needs in a way that you can. Um, so I'm going to be really interested in this framework and what you think about that. And then Basically, what are the ROI variables that are most important in the research uh, for faculty? Two things are really cropping up from faculty voice that we're hearing around credentialing and, and embedding micro-credentials, certificates, again, benchmarks along a degree pathway along the way for students. Faculty are seeing a teamed approach, meaning that it's not, a, it's, I'm not just a faculty of my one discipline. Everything is a, a team effort in a very different way of doing day-to-day -day work and a different way of thinking about being a faculty. And the second thing we see as an ROI variable for faculty is fluidity in their role. The, ro the role between faculty to administrator and administrator back to faculty, that is becoming much more fluid as we build credentialing programs again, into degree pathways. So that's cropping up in the research and the literature around ROI, for, again, from a faculty perspective. So wrap all of that up to say, depending on who you are in the conversation, what stakeholder and the lens through which you're looking, what you consider ROI and how you see it 
changes. You can see the, 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 the key top variables here. And believe me, these are not comprehensive. There are so many more variables for each population. But one thing in the research is really clear, and with our partners at Straighter Line, ROI is more than just a different salary, a different job, different employment. All of the intangibles that we and students perceive they receive and experience in going through any degree or learning in higher education are real and are valued. They're just different. So while economic mobility 100% matters, look at the federal regulation and gainful employment. Thank you for mentioning it, Asim, earlier. Ultimately, what also really matters are all those intangibles that we still think about uh, as university administrators, faculty, service, academic affairs, and everybody who's got a hand in the learning of an adult. Thanks, Megan. Excellent, thank you. So we have a two-year and a four-year institution here with us. So let's explore, you know, what are the benefits and challenges that you're each seeing from where you sit about alternative credentialing models? I don't know if you want to start, Mordecai. Yeah, I'll jump in there, Megan. And matter of fact, I'll put a, uh, another resource uh, in the chat there. Um, article wrote uh, last year in regards to a bit of this because CCA, so Community College of Aurora, we embraced uh, we rolled out four micro credentials last year. Uh, we were the first within the Colorado Community College system to embrace this, and it had, had it has had extreme uh, success to the point to where we're going to be rolling out new micro credentials this year. Uh, what I attribute contribute the success to attribute it to is is that we did a direct partnership with business and industry in the creation of it. We did not create the micro credential and then ran to business and industry and says, do you like this? Mm -hmm. And I believe that that's the mistake, if I were to be critical, that some of my colleagues in higher education have made. I think that in higher education, we're so smart, we'll cook it up and then tell people that they should like it. Uh, and so I think that that is where the opportunity lies in answering the question, is there value for the students? I think that the value for the students is in the institution doing its due diligence to co-create learning opportunities that are efficient and effective at landing them the opportunity, the job. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, part of what we did with UC Health and Aurora Mental Health and Recovery and the creation of our micro-credentials, it directly was driven towards training those learners towards a desired outcome that would cause for them to score higher on hiring metrics. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have a direct outcome, to them being able to be employed and placed in these jobs, then really what is the value other than them saying I completed something and then having to prove the value themselves? And I don't think that that's the responsibility that we should be placing on learners. Man, that's such a good example, Mordecai. Like, and honestly, I don't think that's a different thing for four-year institutions. Uh, you know, it's it's worth, so it's worth uh, uh, going back and watching that recorded answer for those of you that missed it. Um, it, I will say, uh, you know, something that it's sometimes it's challenging. I know we have a lot of uh, senior leaders or, or or dean level folks, maybe on this call or department chairs. Uh, sometimes ROI conversation is the is the hardest conversation to think about because of the, the shift it presents from what you've been working on your entire careers into now a leadership role. Sometimes I like to uh, use the phrase ROE with some of my, some of the folks that I speak with return on engagement. If we think about you know, the understaffing in higher ed or just trying to pick what we want to prioritize and value, uh, you want to think about is engaging in this or spending time on this activity worthwhile for you, for your team, uh, for any of your employees, for your students. So the ROE could be a, a way to think about this. And if I think about, uh, you know, that return on engagement, uh, then, you know, we can start making sense out of things like where does the industry come in, right? So let's think about, you um, we at Auburn, for example, our business students graduate with a certification in Microsoft Excel because we heard from employers that that is a key skill. Uh, and so it's embedded within our curriculum. And uh, it's great to see students sharing that when they earn it after they've completed that class. Uh, they share it on LinkedIn. They share it on other uh, other resources because they want to be able to tell their story, right? They want to be able to share about what it is that qualifies them or sets them apart. Um, we at Auburn also created a course. We launched it last March called Teaching with Artificial Intelligence. 
uh, and it's now adopted at almost 70 institutions around the country. We have about 10,000 faculty at different institutions engaged in that course. And as a result of completing it, people earn a digital badge. And uh, what we see is graduate students who engage in the course are the hungriest to earn that kind of a credential to be able to share that this is an expertise that they've gained. And so what it is, is our students want to be able to share what it is that they're learning and what are those skills that they're qualified for. And so how do we create those opportunities for them in a strategic way? Uh, a lot of times also, if you think about the, uh, the ROI or the ROE perspective is, uh, a lot of times these micro-credentials serve as a way of you uh, testing out, you know, can we create pathways into more traditional um, credentials as well? Uh, just like you want to be able to try before you buy in some cases, uh, a lot of folks that are new to higher ed want to be able to engage in, you know, is it, can it fit in my schedule? Is this something that I'm interested in? Uh, is this going to teach me in the way that I want to learn? Is this going to be something that I actually want to learn in terms of what the career outcomes may be? And so, uh, so being able to create um, shorter or easier learning opportunities becomes important. And now we have to watch what, um, you know, the rulemaking changes are going to be for that as well. So something that worth, you know, worth tracking there. Excellent. Thank you. And we keep hearing from our members that they're very interested in micro-credentials. Um, sometimes they don't know where to start. Sometimes they don't know, you know where to invest their energies and who needs to be involved in the conversations from the get-go. But if you could each offer one piece of advice on where to get started, that would be helpful. We'll start with you, Awesome, because you're off mic. <laughs> Yeah, I do. Uh, I, so uh, bias aside, so I'm an executive board member on APSEA, but I do, I think that uh, UPCEA uh, is, you know, your, uh, uh, is your source if you want to be engaged in terms of what uh, alternative credentials or micro-credentials or any of the phrases would have you uh, that are out there. I do encourage you to find that community. Uh, there's actually a conference dedicated to uh, alternative and micro-credentials. It's going to be New Orleans this year. Uh, that is a, a fantastic Place to get started. You'll have, uh, and you're not alone. Most institutions, according to the survey results, right? Most institutions are exactly where you are, which is, okay, this is probably something I should look at. What do I do next? And uh, and so uh, finding community with that is, is important. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, just in terms of looking at what the, uh, engaging your employers uh, and seeing what kind of needs there are uh, becomes important. Mordecai, what would you say next? I would say step number one is join WCET. If you aren't a member, that's your your that's your step number one. Start right there. Uh, but once I you assume people are already members if they're on this call. <laughs> <so>. Yes, <laughs> and yes. <laughs> but if you have your membership, the next step, as I seem, uh, just to only build on what he was saying, there are a few options out there. Uh, as I shared in our article, Education Design Lab is who we worked with, but it just so happened there was a synergy there because there was a partnership already happening here in the state of Colorado with our community college system. Wherever that synergy lies for you, I think it's just good to work with someone that's been proven, I think, in the space, um, especially if your institution does not have acumen in that area. Uh, someone that's proven in the space, and then also pairing yourself with an entity that uh, is on a long-term trajectory to be in this work, uh, not a flash-in-the-pan organization that's now looking to just jump on something that's brand new and hot. You want to pair yourself with someone that's been proven to build out the infrastructure, the learning experiences, and even has some strong industry relationships that can help carry your institution the rest of the way. Thank you. So I'm going to, can I put those two things together, Megan? I'm going to. As I'm long gonna, as you weave in the importance of joining WCET. Deal. Okay, here we go. So, but but it's actually really true. So if you take an UPSEA, a, a design lab, a WCET, all of those organizations will connect you with, honestly, like-minded peers who have done the work, who've built out some of the playbook. Mordecai, I'm going to go on, go spin a little bit on your idea of somebody who's really committed, right? They, this is not a flash in the pan. The great thing is the higher ed, we're, we are a sharing community. We will learn from each other. So getting connected into these organizations and then asking the question, who is recently doing this work at the place where I am or has gone through this and has the institutional muscle memory to mentor well, coach well, and build your network around this to get smart as, as your institution as you begin the work. But at the, in the end of the day, I would say, start small and get started. 
like get started, but I'm going to, I'm going to parallel Mordecai a little bit. Listen, you got to listen to your local state regional needs. It's better rather than build the magic widget and carry it forth, build based on need. And to do that, we have to listen. Thanks, Megan. Megan, if I can just add, I think, you know, to add on to Amy's uh, start small, but get started. I think that's such a great point. I, you know, some of you guys are asking about how do you engage your faculty as well in some of these innovative ideas and and really like these kinds of course development and, and, and program offerings for micro credentials can offer that opportunity to engage with faculty because the right faculty that you want to work with, right? They are interested in what are the emerging trends, what are the what are the needs for my students, and how do I teach that in the most creative and and uh, you know pedagogically innovative way possible? And so you know, it can serve as kind of a, a, a conduit or maybe just even, you know, the catalyst for that conversation on your campus as well. Excellent. Great responses. Thank you. And I'm seeing the questions build up in the Q&A. So I want to quickly move through our next two buckets, emerging technologies affecting teaching and learning, as well as the impact of technologies on the student experience. So we'll, we'll kind of move through those and then get to the audience Q&A. So awesome. I'm going to start with you. How are some of the emerging technologies, such as AI, transforming the teaching and learning experience in higher education? Yeah, I mean, the reality is, is none of them will transform anything if we, unless we actually do something with it. And so, uh, so the human element is still the most important element in the way we deliver higher education, and, and will likely continue to deliver higher education in the U.S. So, uh, but I will say that uh, to me personally, artificial intelligence presents the uh, the biggest opportunity as well as, uh, you know, the uh, the most ready in terms of where where we could be engaged. Um, so both from a perspective of, you know, what we've just talked about in terms of our, our students' readiness for the market that they're entering, um, you know, we want to make sure that our students have the the skills that they'll need to be relevant in the, in the profession that they're choosing to pursue. Uh, and artificial intelligence to me presents that. And certainly from a perspective of, how we can find uh, efficiencies in our work processes and business processes and course, uh, you know, in terms of course development, teaching, assignment development, things like that. Uh, I think artificial intelligence is going to be uh, at the forefront. I understand we all have limited time. So if you can only pick uh, one or two things, uh, you know, I think this is uh, something that's a safe bet in terms of um, trying to at least keep up with uh, some of the trends in terms of what can be done. Uh, what I recommend there is honestly engaging in conversation first, uh, making sure that you engage in conversation with faculty, with students, with your professional staff uh, in terms of how they're already using AI, how they wish they could use it. Uh, there's expertise available, like I mentioned at Auburn, we've developed that course, particularly for teaching, but there's, you know, there's many uh, val valuable folks, uh, very, I mean, talented folks all over the country, all over the world uh, who are providing lots of resources. Uh, sometimes it can feel like there's a lot of noise out there, but uh, certainly like, you know, if you pick a couple and just tend to follow uh, what's out there in terms of what's possible, uh, I do think that using AI to enhance uh, teaching, using AI to uh, make sure that students are understanding what the technology can do for their professions uh, is, is going to be an important thing that cannot be ignored for 2024. Agreed. And I'm going to just quickly jump in and say I had an interesting conversation with somebody at the University of Mississippi the other day. And her point was that AI is creating these efficiencies and it's finally an opportunity to provide an opportunity for wellness for faculty and staff because that added efficiency shouldn't just be filled with more work, right? This is finally an opportunity that maybe we can rethink what the work day and the work week truly looks like. So I thought that was an interesting perspective. And um, awesome, if you could just put a link to that course in the chat when you have a chance, it's incredibly valuable. And my last comment on that is the WCET has an AI work group. Um, it's a it's an online community and it's open to members and non-members. So if you're interested, just put your name in the chat and we'll make sure to add you to that. So I'm done interrupting the conversation, but Amy or Mordecai, if you want to talk about you know, how institutions can leverage these technologies or what some of the considerations uh, for equity and, and those implications might be, um, please do so. Mordecai, go ahead. Oh, I was going to offer it to Amy. I feel like Amy, you want to oh, jump in. I do. I'll just do this one really quickly. One of the things we've learned from our partnership with our partner in our partner institutions at Strider Line 
is when universities are thinking, I mean, there's so much swirl in the AI world, right? There's just so much and it can feel overwhelming. When universities are beginning to really think about it, they're starting at the seat of the student. What's the number one mission that we all have, right? Student learning, learning period. And so start with the student. So when they're thinking about AI and how to incorporate it into the, in all of the work, they're starting at the level of the student and making it student-centric AI and then expanding outward. We have found that to be a really interesting finding in our conversations. Like who would have thought, because there's always that question, do we use it for curriculum, process, workflow, finances, marketing? I mean, there's so many places it fits, right? where do you start? And we found the, the institutions who started with where the student may use it and began begun there, that has been the most impactful for adoption, understanding, and cultural shift. I'll pass it to you with that, Mordecai. Thank you so much. You know, I will tell you, long gone are the days of online education being... Uh, Tell us what you think by Friday, responded to classmates by Sunday. I just think that that AI is now truly, I mean, even how we measure student learning outcomes, I'm excited about the efficiencies. I heard a sim uh, talking about this. Uh, I think about the tutorial, AI tutorial services that are now available, making uh, supports, academic supports more accessible. I love, uh, for those, I'm trying to think if it was 2020 or Dateline, but there was a uh, a piece on what China is doing in the rural ed, uh, classroom space with AI in terms of monitoring students' uh, eyes to determine uh, if they are properly comprehending the information uh, and can tell at what point that the, the young student began to not comprehend a certain mathematic problem. I get excited because I could imagine this is going to help husbands all over the country. You're getting ready to say the wrong thing. Let AI jump in there and just save your marriage. You know, so my point is, is that it's just exciting to see all the different tools that are getting ready to jump in there. It's just so important, though, for institutions to embrace it. And the part that I won't call it a concern, but I'm very hopeful that we figure out is that some institutions don't have the budgets to be able to embrace some of these tools in a manner like some other institutions can. And I think that I'm hoping that in the spirit of equity, there's some kind of mechanism that can help some of these institutions that can truly transform their student experiences, but they don't have the large wallets like some of these other institutions because all students certainly deserve to uh, have these learning uh, resources a part of their learning experiences. Exactly, I think that's such a critical point. Um, Awesome, and I were at a, a AI conference down in Arizona, and um, a woman from Khan Academy was there, and she was saying, you know, our, our Khan Migo is only four dollars per user, which you know, four dollars adds up over time, and that can really impact budgets, especially for institutions that don't have budgets. So, if you're going to require the, the usage of these tools for your students, it needs to be something that is equivalent across platforms. So any other thoughts on AI and the student or uh, teacher experience? Yeah, I would, uh, you know, I think uh, I think there should be a kind of a an experiment, experimental area for you where you encourage your colleagues and yourself to look at what's possible before it even sees the time with students because you don't want to overwhelm students either with tons of different ed tech tools and tons of different resources. Um, it is fair to question uh, vendors and ask them, how are they using the, the data? How are they using the technology? Uh, you still want to be mindful of, uh, you know, privacy and, and, and information and things like that. So uh, I encourage, like, you know, you shouldn't adopt everything you see, uh, question what you do see, but then does it align with the core mission and the core values that you're still trying to pursue at, at, that are part of your institution? And is it equitable and accessible? And is it truly accessible? Good to push on vendors for that. All right, anything else before we jump into some of the audience Q&A? Okay. All right, we're gonna go ahead and start with the first question from an anonymous attendee in this uh, roll back about 30 minutes into the conversation. What is an effective way to scale educational technology across divisions and campuses? And how can institutions increase faculty participation in technology advancements, policies, procedures, et cetera? would like to take this one? I'll just talk about what we're doing here at, at CCA. Um, in terms of scalability, uh, 
one of the things I would say is, is that it, it is so important that to level set or to create a space to where it becomes a part, integrations become a part of the culture uh, is through continuous professional development, but professional development in a way to where it has been uh, resourced and it is embedded within the academy and the way in which the academy is asking for it. Um, so I think it goes back to that relevance piece because just because you op open up a workshop and a webinar does not mean that everyone's going to attend it or really buy into what's happening there. Uh, I think that uh, academic coaches to support the pedagogy of, uh, of our, our academy, I think is critical. I think responsiveness is, is critical, but also making sure too that accountability is in place, that once you say, okay, Community College of Aurora, we're heading this direction, the proper resources need to be there, uh, on-demand coaching and availability needs to be there, but also then accountability needs to be there too, because if at any point in time, the college is rolling out these integrations, yet a particular department is held behind, is it due to a lack of preparedness, a lack of understanding, uh, because everyone has understandings at different levels, but just finding a way to truly incentivize, and I would leave that, that, leave that last word there, incentivizing the integrations to to help shift the culture, I think is critical and crucial. Great, thank you. Awesome, Amy. Yeah, I think, uh, oh, go ahead, Amy. No, awesome, you got this one, go ahead. Oh, he's on mute. Uh, so I think, uh, sorry, I was just trying to click through. Um, you know, I. I there are, this is a perennial question, right? I, I, th I don't think this is uh, anything new. So, uh, you know, there, at the end of the day, like, you know, faculty, just like anybody else are humans. And so uh, we can only uh, expect so much time. I teach as well, and I don't have the time to do every single thing that I'm supposed to do and then also do more, right? And so I think uh, we have to engage uh we have to be mindful of like, what are we asking of, of faculty, but then also, um, you know, it, what's the end game? Like, is it actually going to make life easier? Is it going to take less time? Is it going to, uh, you know, is it going to give us the value in the, in the, in the longer term that we need? And so just, I think being, being a better filter for what we're asking people to look into and what we're asking folks to do becomes important. Um, and, uh, and then, and then again, going back to being able to tell that story, right? So are we providing, a uh, you know, advancement opportunities or, you know, uh, for those folks that do help us with continual engagement, or is it just like, Hey, buddy, pal, can you help me out with this in your free time? Uh, or are we being equitable, not, you know, in terms of how we're, you know, how we're rewarding the effort that is put it put in by faculty who do engage, uh, and then, uh, and then making sure that they have the platform to be able to tell us what the results are. Do we have, you know, are we being authentic with, hey, we tried this and it didn't work and here's what didn't work about it uh, as well. And so folks know what we're, what we're working on. All right. Okay, I'm going to jump to Emily's question because I think this is on the hearts and minds of many leaders and educators. So my faculty are very focused on generative AI opportunities and cheating workload issues. What are you all doing with generative AI in the classroom, strategically, administrative, and at a policy level? And uh, I just want to reference that we are putting together a repository of effective policies around AI, so members should stay tuned for that. And um, it'll also be a resource for those in, in the online community. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to uh, share. Um... You know, AI is from a strictly from a teaching and learning inside the classroom aspect. It's a very challenging technology. Uh, there is no way around the fact that faculty have to fundamentally change the way that they think about their assessments and the way they engage and partner with their students. Um, I, you know, students are not more or less likely to cheat because of AI. And that is what the data shows so far. Um, the best study on this is from Stanford uh, that particularly engages high school students. You know, the, the fundamental region, reasons for why students cheat or are the same, right? In terms of if we're doing high stakes stuff, if we're doing, you know, not enough time, we're not providing enough scaffolding. We're, I mean, all the, the common things that we already know 
And so this is, uh, this is, I don't, there is no technology that exists currently or that will exist that will help faculty identify if something is written or created with generative AI. I just want to make sure that people understand that, that people will charge you money for this, but there is no technology that exists now or that will exist that will tell you if something is generated with AI. And so, um, so, you know, like, I, I think it's important for us to have that conversation. Now. I mean, that means we need to work with faculty to say, hey, you're going to have to fundamentally change the way that you grade and create assessments for your students. Um, if it's simply being happy with the output of submit an essay, then you're just going to be happy with the output, right? But if you're willing to go back and change the way you do assessments and focus on the inputs, then now you're having a conversation about what is it that we're actually teaching? What is it that we're actually assessing? Uh, and so, yeah, there's no easy answer, and I don't want to sugarcoat that in any way. Thank you. Amy, you want to go ahead? I do. I want to add to that one. So a same, I'm going to spin off that one a little bit. That's exactly what we did at Strider Line. So we have 70 gen ed classes. AI is coming to the foreground. And at, you know, at the end of the day, we live proctor every high stakes assessment, your final exams, but what do I do with all the formative assessment along the way? We changed the entire assessment model structure to focus on not only authentic, but process, um, which feels a little retro, to be quite honest with you. You know, let me watch you do your math problem, for example, but the reality of it is we did, a, we, we really rethought assessments. When we did that, that changed everything. That changed the instructional methodologies, that changed the structure of courses, and the student experience, we've had a lot of positive feedback from our learners in that respect. So that assessment structure, it's funny to say, start with the end in mind, but it actually really works. We worked at the end to change student experience and it we, found, we have found that to be helpful. So I'm just parroting what you're saying and confirming it, but it's, it's no easy feat and we're still in play. It's still, it's an ongoing, ongoing, battle, if you will, something we're always working on. I can Thanks. add a little bit more of a specific uh, example as well. So I teach an in, in, intro to information systems class in the College of Business here at Auburn and uh, about 120 students from all different business majors. Uh, and so what I'm able to do is I'm actually able to provide, I've added AI guidance to every assignment that I have. I use active learning. So there's an assignment almost every day in class. And so say if I'm teaching a very general concept, what I'm actually able to do is encourage them to use generative AI to personalize that concept for their field, right? So for example, we may be covering something like, you know, uh, e-commerce. Well, I can say well, engage with generative AI and uh, ask about how e-commerce uh, affects, you know, your, your major in finance, for example. Or I can use generative AI to actually create case studies on that particular topic relevant for different majors with leading questions that are relevant for the different majors that I have. So it actually helps you personalize the learning a lot more than we've been able to do before and actually have an engaged conversation with my students about how this tool is not just for cheating, but it's actually, you know, it's actually a, a tool that we can use constructively. And I think that's the difference, right? We've had, for example, social media came out 15, 20 years ago. We missed the boat. We didn't, I, you know, we never had classes that faculty taught us about how to use social media and social engagement. And in many ways, society is paying the price for that now. And so we can't miss the boat for AI in the same way. We have to engage our students and, and talk with them about what the discipline, responsible and ethical ways are uh, to use generative AI. I just wanna jump in there and say what you just put, uh, what my colleagues just said is, is is right on. Megan, what you just put in the chat is, is key and at the forefront of my mind. AI expectations uh, for the, the syllabus, it should be in there day one. Uh, anyone that's on the call or watching this recording that you have a policy, so I'll speak to the policy part, that you have a policy responsibility, whether it be guideline responsibility, whether it be process uh, responsibility, that you do your best to work with the academy to uh, put put in, in this ever-changing world of AI uh, something uh, in writing uh, that, that protects the academy as well as students and themselves and welcomes and brings AI in, but also does not penalize where there is gray space that has not been declared for that respective institution. So this shouldn't turn out to be an I got you. And I'm starting to hear too many I got you situations. Exactly. Mordecai, I'm going to keep you 
um, for this next question. And then I think we're going to have to wrap up, but I just want to say, this is what I love so much about uh, the WCET community. There's so much good sharing and collaboration taking place in the chat. So we'll be sure to pull out some of those links and share them when we send the link to the recording. But uh, the final question, Mordecai, if you could begin is, do you have any advice for smaller institutions with tighter budgets who want to engage with these trends? or any unique niches smaller institutions can fill in the context of these changes. So how do you how do you do more with less? Yeah, yeah, two things come to mind and this is the responsibility of of institutions of higher education to really take a look at their strategic plans and how they're properly resourcing those strategic plans. Um just like, you know, in the past few years now we've moved on from equity being something that sits outside of a strategic plan to being integrated within a strategic plan. Artificial intelligence and technology have to be viewed in the same way. It needs to be embedded in all aspects, just like equity is embedded in all aspects. And then as you look at that strategic plan and how to properly resource it, it's not about can we afford it, it's, it's, it's that we cannot afford not to. Um, and so I think that even though it will not be the biggest and the shiniest, uh, by having wide scalability uh, throughout the institution of what is determined and decided and brought on is critical and crucial uh, and a commitment, institutional commitment to utilizing all the resources that's available through technology. I am tired of hearing of institutions buying these suites and these applications, but don't turn on all the buttons. They don't turn on all the functionalities of it. And, and, and it's no good to the institution or the student. So that's one thing I would say, make sure that it is bedded in the strategic plan and properly resourced. And I think the second part of that is, is to get smart uh, about what are grants and other uh, opportunities that are available for these institutions to pursue that they just have not done so. Uh, and it doesn't mean hiring a full-time employee. That really means something for these smaller institutions. It doesn't mean having to, to, to totally fund an, an entire FTE, but you can contract with someone to help the institution through uh, what is a season of needing to find additional resources until that is uh, obtained by the institution. Either one of the other panelists want to answer that question? Okay, uh, there was a, one more question added. I know that I said that was the last question, but um, this one's about micro-credentials, Amy, so I'll let you take it. Micro-credentialing has proved very successful in the private market. We all know Google certificates, um, Amazon Web Services has their own. So many potential students are looking for alternatives to higher ed in order to start their career. Do you feel that higher ed has shifted away from the hard academics and failing to meet the skills gap in lieu of equity and multicultural approaches. So in sum, should higher ed adopt more of a business model and less of a social model to our achieve ROI? I would say that I don't think it's an either or, to be honest. I don't think it is a business model or, you know, achievable, uh, like a liberal arts education. I don't think it's an either or. I think, I think it's a both to be honest. And so should we? I would say if we are serving our communities, then the answer would be yes, if that's the community need. We have to remember that higher education is an industry, but that industry is locally, it exists in local ecosystems, right? It doesn't exist in isolation. Even online exists in local ecosystems. People live and work somewhere. And so while we think about micro-credentials, such as let's use Google as an example, Go back in the Wayback Machine. You have to remember that Google actually partnered with universities for its curriculum when it began. And it took seven years for Google to actually get to a place where it could separate from the university and the Google certs stood on their own. That was their intentional business model to try to get legitimacy for what they were trying to do. Okay, now fast forward that for AWS and Amazon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I can keep going on. But I would argue that it's really... It's a both. And the ultimate goal, I'm going to go back to Mordecai's earlier conversation, as Sim also alluded to this, in that you, what is your local community? What does your community need? Who are you serving? What is your mission? And what does your community need? And your community doesn't have to be a national play. That's not all that we do. So I feel like I'm not answering the question. I apologize for that. But I also feel like it's it's a, it's nuanced and complicated. It's a really good question. And thank you for giving us that question that will keep me up at night now. 
I'm grateful. <laughs> that one's going to keep me awake. <laughs> Thanks, of Meg. Of course. Of course. Okay. On that note, I'd like to go around and if you just have one piece of wisdom you want to share with our audience or one thing that you're really looking forward to and hopeful about this year so we can end on a very high note. I always like to end our conversations that way. So awesome. We'll start with you because you're off of mute. Yeah, I would uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, it's amazing how fast the time goes when you're talking about things you enjoy, but I uh, thank you for, uh, for, for joining us. And uh, I will say, I think my, my one thing would be stay engaged. Uh, you know, if it can feel like a lot, it can feel like a lot going on. You don't have to solve all the problems in the world, but um, staying engaged is important. Amy? I would say, uh, so thank you. It's been wonderful to be with all of you for this in what feels like a, an incredibly short amount of time. I'm going to go back to my start small, but get started. We can debate the best way and the resources and the how-to for a while, but sometimes getting started is the best way to explore. And back to a Sim's earlier comment, so you need to have a sandbox to experience in and lots of conversation around. So I would say my takeaway, get started somewhere. Somewhere is better than not getting started. Mordecai? Yeah, I'll jump in there and say, even thinking about that that question that Amy was answering, uh, I'll finish by saying, uh, don't forget the conversation about uh, the difference between transactional versus transformation. Yes. The learning outcomes and the attainment of the learning outcomes, we should not be using AI to increase the transaction transactionality of the, the learning outcomes of the attainment of the learning outcomes. AI should be integrated to empower the learning experiences towards student transformation. So I think it's so important that we never create a transactional relationship with learning outcomes. It's sacred. Uh, we need to maintain the integrity of the academy. We should utilize resources to help towards the transformation of student. Look at ways to truly uh, innovate the student transformational experiences on the front end uh, prior to the classroom and even within the class Classroom, but never should it be used to make uh, a transaction for a student when it comes to learning outcomes. Excellent. Well, Amy, awesome. Mordecai, so grateful for your time. Thank you to the participants for the wonderful conversation. I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Kim and she'll take us through the final slides. And speaking of things to be excited about, there's a few things that she's going to touch on in the next slide. So stay tuned. Great. Thank you, Megan, for guiding our conversation today and so much uh, so grateful to our panelists for their insights into what to watch for this year. Um, we will be sharing the recording with registrants in a follow up email, so stay tuned for that. Um, it should be in your inbox, hopefully before the weekend, um, and it will also be posted on our website. You can learn more about WCET, our work, and our upcoming events on our website. We should be announcing some new webcasts very soon. Um, and our upcoming virtual summit, the Elements of Practice and Policy of AI in Education, will be hosted virtually on February 22nd. Um, you'll get to see Awesome again. So <laughs> if you enjoyed what he's saying, uh, be sure to register. Join for WCET that. now so you right, can enjoy yeah. that. <laughs> And be sure to join WCET because it is an exclusive event for our members, um, and we hope you can join us. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors and our supporting members who make much of our work at WCET possible. Um, thank you so much to our attendees for joining us today. We hope you have a great, wonderful day and enjoy the long weekend. Bye, take everyone. Care, everybody. Take care. Thanks again. Bye, baby. Stay warm. <laughs>